Hello and welcome, Cheap Shot Nation, to another retro review for Cheap Shot Entertainment. As ever, I'm your host, Luke, and you are the Cheap Shot Nation. We're going to be going through the year 2003, exactly 20 years ago. To this day, SummerSlam 2003 happened on the 24th of August 2023. It took place in Phoenix, Arizona at the U.S. Airways Center and was attended by 16,113 fans. The theme song for this pay-per-view or premium live event, as they call it now, was St. Anger by Metallica. And, of course, the main event was the second ever elimination chamber between Triple H, Goldberg, Kevin Nash, Chris Jericho, Randy Orton and Shawn Michaels, the winner of the first ever Elimination Chamber. The arena appears in two games. That is WWE Smackdown vs. Raw and WWE Day of Reckoning, which I think was a GameCube exclusive. And before we get into the main part of the show, main part of the video... I'm just going to tell you what happened on Sunday Night Heat as well. It was a Cruiserweight Championship match. Rey Mysterio defeated Shannon Moore to retain the title. And then we go on to the main show. So as we go through, I'm going to give you my thoughts on the matches. Is it going to live up to vengeance? Who knows? It is a cross-branded pay-per-view. Of course, the brand split had happened by this point. And, uh, yeah, looking forward to this one. SummerSlam is usually pretty good and hot off the heels of 2002 where Brock Lesnar arrived on the scene. What will 2003 bring? We'll see you in the main part of the video. This is awesome! This is awesome! Into the first match of SummerSlam 2003. And it is a World Tag Team Championship match between the Dudley Boys, the Challengers, who are made up of Devon and Bubba Ray. And they are going against La Resistance, who are made up of René Dupree and Sylvain Ranier. And <clears throat> there's a lot to take in here, get a nice video package. There's a, a lot of symbolism where La Resistance bury the Dudley boys under the American flag and we get a hot start here uh, Dudley boys wasting no time they go and jump on La Resistance Devon brings uh, Rene Dupree back to the ring and the match gets going so Dudley boys pretty much all the way on top here Silva and Runier on the outside Cannot get the tag from Rene Dupree. Uh, typical cowardly heel tag team here with Dudley Boys getting the USA chance all the way through. Um, it does break down uh, around the three-quarter mark and the referee loses control of this one. Obviously, with the championships on the line there is a little bit of leeway with the counts but uh, apart from that yeah the referee Nick Patrick lost control but uh, it does lead to a very interesting finish we get the what's up we get a 3D just as Bubba Ray is telling Devon to get the tables and uh, it would then lead to Sylvan Runier climbing into the ring uh, breaking up the three count by dragging the referee out of the ring. And at that point, the referee is completely taken by Bubba Ray and Silver Runier, to which the cameraman jumps in the ring, smacks Devon over the head with a camera, uh, hoping it was a fake camera, because otherwise it looked quite expensive, and that saddens me. Uh, and... Uh, they, uh, La Resistance, get the win. Um, at the end of the match, the beatdown continues. Spike Dudley comes in to make the save. He gets wrapped around the side of the head uh, with the camera just for kicks. 
I guess, and the wig comes off of the cameraman who reveals himself to be the American, uh, the anti-American sympathiser, as Bubba Ray calls it in an interview after the, sh- after the match. And he reveals himself to be the serviceman who turned up on SmackDown, or on Raw rather, um, Rob Conway. They go for the beatdown, um, walk away with the championships as the Dudley boys come back on top after the beatdown. And the champions are still La Resistance. Uh, they now have an extra person in their ranks. So they are getting stronger and stronger. And it's good to see um, a young tag team being pushed at this point in time because the WWE were swimming in talent at this point, uh, but put their faith in a lot of the WWE talent rather than the talent that was coming through or WCW, ECW talent. So, yeah, I think this is the turning point, which is good. I'm going to give this one three cheap shots out of five. It was a good tag team match. Didn't give much time owing to the fact that the main event is a big one. And uh, it was good. The coach interviews the Dudley boys after the match. And the Dudley boys say they're not going to sleep until they get their tag team championships back. So we move on to the second match now, and it is a bit of a grudge match as Tilly watches on. If you love dogs, please give us a like and subscribe. Hi, Tilly. No, she's completely out. We move on to the second match, and it is a bit of a grudge match, as I already mentioned. It is The Undertaker versus The A-Train. The storyline here is that at the last pay-per-view that A-Train took out Stephanie Stephanie McMahon during her match with Sable and caused her a long-term injury, to which The Undertaker uh, stood up to Mr McMahon because the A-Train has been a bit of a hitman for Mr McMahon and told him that you don't do that to your own daughter, which I tend to agree with. And this is, uh, like I say, it's a grudge match. It's two veterans if you like. Certainly The Undertaker, maybe not so much A-Train at this point, but he knew how to throw his body around and knew how to use what he had. He was also a very quick big man and sometimes doesn't come up, in fact most often doesn't come up in discussions of the uh, best big man because A-Train is actually really good and uh, it shows here. There's a lot of talking, a lot of... um, Focus on the Undertaker's ribs, which were previously injured by a two by four by uh, A Train during his match with John Cena, I believe it was on SmackDown. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of focus on the ribs here. Very tentative, the Undertaker's not his usual game when it comes to a wrestling match, but this is actually a really good match, and uh, it is because they're continuing the storyline and. Because the Undertaker is favouring his ribs and the initial lock-up. The A-Train wins, gets the Undertaker into the corner and goes straight for the ribs. He tries to pull his pull his singlet away, tries to get to the ribs, the taped up ribs. And it just immediately puts a marker on those ribs. This shows as A-Train goes for um, bear hugs and things like that as they battle to the outside. Undertaker goes into the post back first from the A train, and there's a lot of, um, again, focus on the ribs. With the idea that the Undertaker's A game is power, it's a choke slam, it's the last ride at this point in time, and the Tombstone Pile Driver all require a massive amount of upper body strength to position your opponent to get that to a good point and which point this brings us to the crescendo because the undertaker goes for the last ride Uh, with a dream being over 300 pounds that's going to be difficult anyway but with injured ribs even worse a train manages to escape pushes the undertaker into the referee uh, brian hebner 
and Brian Hebner takes a fall. His dad will be very proud of him at this point in time. Uh, a train then gets the um, derailer onto the Undertaker, uh, which is a double choke bomb, uh, which looks really cool, by the way, really cool move, and a near fall, to which the A train comes back again with a clothesline and completely misses. Um, Undertaker does the same thing and takes out Brian Hebner, to which he does a flip. Even more proud moments here from Earl Hebner and his son. Uh, <laughs> long running joke. Greatest Falls of Earl Hebner, three disc DVD set available now. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, the referee is out. The Undertaker manages to get a, um, I think it's a choke slam on the A train at this point. Uh, goes for the near fall. Obviously, the referee is out. Gets a near fall. Um, and oh no, it's not a choke slam. A train comes in with a chair rather, and Undertaker kicks it into his face. Um, near fall. Undertaker then manages to uh, turn it round into a choke slam for the finish. And uh, Undertaker wins. It is at this point where The Undertaker goes for the last ride after the bell and Sable comes in, tries to tempt The Undertaker away from hitting that move to which Stephanie McMahon's music hits and Stephanie McMahon comes down to beat up her long-standing rival Sable. A-Train saves her and they scarp her whilst Sable is readjusting her ring wear and... Uh, Stephen McMahon has a huge grin on her face. Undertaker wins. I really enjoyed this one. Again, short and sweet. I'm going to give it a three cheap shots out of five. These two guys know how to work. And it shows that they've got a good working relationship inside that squared circle. Um, really enjoyed this one. And uh, we move on. So we're moving on <clears throat> to the next match. It is the literal grudge match of the card. It is Shane McMahon versus Eric Bischoff. And with Eric Bischoff seemingly forcing himself on Linda McMahon, Shane has a lot to fight for here because <clears throat> Eric Bischoff has done nothing but torture and humiliate Shane McMahon up to this point. Stone Cold gave Eric Bischoff a contract, had him go against Kane. Kane lost that match. Eric Bischoff won, but the stipulation in the contract, the small print, meant that the winner of that match would go on to SummerSlam to face Shane McMahon. And so be it. We now have Shane McMahon versus Eric Bischoff. Shane McMahon comes out of the blocks really quickly on this one, just beating the tar out of Eric Bischoff. Eric Bischoff then gets the upper hand with the help of the coach, Jonathan Coachman, with the use of a chair. Uh, it's at this point that Charles Robinson, Minnie Nate, calls for the bell for the disqualification. Eric Bischoff says, no, 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 no. There's no disqualifications in this match. And it's false count anywhere. Coach throws Shane McMahon into the steel stairs, near fall. Um, throws um, Shane McMahon into the ring again, and they start beating on him and things like that, and, and to the point where uh, Coach is holding him up. Bischoff is going in with the karate fighting punches, I suppose. Glass shatters, stone cold turns up. It's a bit dead. At this point, I've got to I've got to admit it is not a good match. It's not really a match at all. It does have a good payoff though because uh, Coach is uh, teasing Stone Cold. There's a no contact clause. Shane McMahon pushes Coach in Stone Cold. Stone Cold beats up the Coach. Shane McMahon joins in. Eric Bischoff does the same thing. He's laying down on the floor, and uh, Shane McMahon picks him up. Slaps Stone Cold Steve Austin. Eric Bischoff does that on his own, of course. And all of a sudden, 
you've got the no contact clause. It's out of the window. Stone Cold Stunner near for Eric Bischoff with a awful kick out after that one. Uh, Shane is not finished. Loads Shane, loads Eric Bischoff onto the table. Shane McMahon jumps off. One, two, three, and the win. Stone Cold and Shane McMahon celebrate in the middle of the ring with a couple of beers. This is not a good match. I'm going straight in with this one. It's a one cheap shot out of five. And that's only because Stone Cold turned up to get the crowd going because it was dying a death at this point. Um, <clears throat> so we move on into the back and it's Nature Boy Ric Flair with Randy Orton. Nature's telling him that Triple H goes in with the championship. He comes out with the championship, obviously referring to the Elimination Chamber match later on in the card. Uh, Randy Orton's what if Triple H turns up, there's no what if. Uh, there's a little smirk on Randy Orton's face. He knows his role, he's got it. And we move on to the next match. So we move on to the next match. It is a fatal four-way match. And as Tony Chimmel says in the ring, a fatal four-way match means that all four competitors are in the ring at the same time. And it is one fall to a finish. Meaning the first person to get the pinfall or the submission wins the match. It is Eddie Guerrero, the current reigning and defending US champion. Versus the rabid Wolverine, the person who he beat to become that first ever WWE US champion. We've also got Tajiri and Rhino to add the international flavour to this match. All four of these guys are absolutely awesome when it comes to putting on a match. However, this match was just not given enough time. And they did what they could with the time limit that they were given. It's just a real shame because all four of these competitors would have been absolutely fantastic at putting on a slightly longer match had they been given the time. Understood based on the fact that the main event is a, an elimination chamber, which obviously takes a finite amount of time. And we've also got the WWE Championship match as well, which would be the match thereafter. Now, <clears throat> I enjoyed this match for what it was. Like I say, it could have been given a bit longer. I'm going to go straight down the middle as Eddie Guerrero picks up the win and retains the championship. Straight down the middle at two and a half cheap shots out of five for this one and it does indeed mark the rough halfway point of this pay-per-view so we move on to the next match so we're moving on to the next match next and it is for the wwe championship a smackdown exclusive it is kurt angle the current wwe champion taking on the former champion the man who he beat for said championship at WrestleMania 19, uh, sorry, Brock Lesnar beat Kurt Angle at WrestleMania 19, Kurt Angle picked it up at Vengeance the previous month. Now, <clears throat> um, we have a number of factors here, Brock Lesnar's gone to the lunatic fringe as they called it, uh, I think there was another wrestler that used that phrase or the commentators used that phrase for. But it was Brock Lesnar who first got the lunatic fringe. Now, he's been on a bit of a tear. He's beating people up left, right and centre. Kurt Angle came out and openly said that Brock Lesnar was one of the only people that checked on him when he was in the hospital and just generally became a very good friend. So... This is really interesting, the way this bout is set up. The focus here for Brock Lesnar is using his strength, whereas Kurt Angle will use his quickness to take down the animal, the big the monster. Um, however, 
both have very good technical ability so this one is set up absolutely wonderfully and it is in fact a an excellent match from start to finish it starts off with Brock Lesnar getting the best of Kurt Angle um, having the power game on his side a couple of lockups a couple of pushbacks uh, until Kurt Angle uses his quickness to go behind and take Brock Lesnar down this would continue a little bit more quite a slow start lots of holds lots of rest holds um, Kurt Angle would eventually get the ankle lock in and cause that cause Brock Lesnar to lose his vertical base which is just insane because most of his stuff is power game the F5 is on the shoulders and and flippy round uh, best way I can describe it um, so yeah it's um, it's just plain interesting really in the way that it is set up and uh, there was some outside factors the referee also got taken out as well and uh, like I say the outside factors were in fact um, the um, the boss so yeah the uh, outside factor would come into play with Vince McMahon and a chair the referee would get taken out and that would come into play Kurt Angle would get the ankle lock on the challenger once again and he would tap out but the referee would be down this would lead to an F5, a one-footed F5, I might add, as well, which was really impressive from Brock, Brock Lesnar. But you wouldn't expect any different from him, really. And uh, that continued. Kurt Angle, it did eventually <coughs> reverse <coughs> a second F5 into a back trip and into the ankle lock again, this time whilst... Brock Lesnar was looking McMahon in the eyes. He taps out and Kurt Angle retains via submission. This is as close to perfect as you're going to get. This is just really good. Um, incredible, in fact. And it would be uh, Kurt Angle like I say, picking up the victory here and retaining the championship. I'm going to give this one four and a half cheap shots out of five. And we move on to the semi-main event and the main event now. Apologies for that last couple of, of matches. They were recorded in my car whilst being stranded on the M1 between Junction 28 and 29. Now... <clears throat> We're back in a normal environment now, rather than being in a car. So let's move on to the next match. It is a straight grudge match. There's a lot of these on this show. It is Rob Van Dam versus the Unmasked Team. Now, <clears throat> the whole story behind this is that if Kane lost a, a match, I think it was the uh, unification match on Raw between Triple H and Kane, then he would have to one mass, uh, and that has led to a path of destruction, including setting JR on fire, uh, Tombstone DDTing uh, Linda McMahon, uh, doing lots of things to Shane McMahon, and also to his former tag team partner Rob Van Dam. Now they were a great tag team they had the right mix of speed and power but obviously once that kind of stuff happens you get choke slammed you get set on fire or at least get petrol poured on you yes petrol then yeah it's going to cause a few cracks isn't it um so 
yeah, we'll move on to the match. Before the match starts, Howard Finkel does say that he has been informed that it's going to be contested under no holds barred. Brilliant. Kane's a badass, proven in the hardcore division. RVD, former ECW champion. What could possibly be wrong about this match? Not a lot, actually. It's great um, for the fact that even though it's no holds barred, there's no blood. It's done in a way that looks nasty, but still contains itself, which goes to prove that modern day wrestling um, is just running out of ideas. And <clears throat> I prefer one company's brand of wrestling over the other company's brand. So <clears throat> that's not to say that other people wouldn't love that. I know if I was a lot younger, probably would love the other brand. So anyway, back to 2003. Uh, Kane goes in hard on this one. Van Damme obviously tries to get the jump. He knows that Kane's a lot bigger, a lot more powerful. And he goes to get the jump on him. Kane is pretty dominant in this match to be fair and uh, yeah it it would have obviously fighting on the outside There's not a lot of action on the inside i think literally just the pin which uh, does come after after kane's tombstone pile driven rvd on the mats outside rolled him back in got the one two three kane is your winner but it also uses the barrier. It uses the weapons that are inexplicably under the ring because, you know, wrestling. And, uh, yeah, they just use everything they possibly can for this. And it's good. So I'm going to give this one a three cheap shots out of five rating. <clears throat> because, obviously, it's got the no holds barred. They don't go around the arena. I think that adds something to the television experience. However, having been in a an environment where there is hardcore matches or no holds barred matches, fourth count anywhere matches, if it's not a small venue, then you lose a lot of your crowd because they just can't see it. I've been to matches where they've gone and battled out in the car park. Sounds cool. Looks great on a video game. It looks great in big companies when they can follow it with the camera. But in a small venue, it doesn't quite happen. And I think that's still the same even in the big venue. If, you, if you're lost in a big venue, it's perhaps even worse. But, uh, yeah, they don't go outside. They don't go into the crowd. They just use the barriers. They, you know have that interaction with the crowd with the with the front row which is cool and uh, it's a decent match as you would expect from these two both absolute veterans in different companies uh one being ecw the other being wwe i mean kane started out as isaac yankin so i mean i mean that says everything started out as a dentist character in the mid 90s um but yeah he's come a long way got the storylines got the reputation got the legendary status and so has rvd as well so like i say three cheap shots out of five it's a good one this And with that, we move on to the main event now. It is the six-pack challenge, if you like, of a Elimination Chamber match. And we would see Triple H defending his championship against the likes of Shawn Michaels, Kevin Nash, two people that he has more than annoyed over the space of the last couple of months kevin ash getting his head shaved that would tie in with the uh punisher movie 
and where he plays the Russian. Uh, good movie, actually, Thomas Jane. And, uh, yeah, we, we'd get those two. We'd also get Goldberg. And... Trying to think who else is in this match. Oh, yeah, Randy Orton. <coughs> as well. Uh, as Triple H, obviously. So, <coughs> we start out with... Shawn Michaels, Chris Jericho, again, a storyline that's been told throughout 2003 from before WrestleMania 19. Had a great match, sleeper hit by WrestleMania 19, these two, and they've had a couple of matches in between, and the feud would continue for a couple of years, actually. Uh, so these two start, if the rules of the match are eluding you for the Elimination Chamber, first two participants start in the ring, they go for around five minutes and then a pod is opened at random um, to uh, release the next person. So the next person comes out. It is indeed Randy Orton, teammate of Triple H. So <clears throat> we get Randy Orton into the mix. He is beating up Shawn Michaels, making sure that he can't get a second win in the second ever elimination chamber. We then get the release of the biggest, the baddest, perhaps the angriest of the competitors in this match in Kevin Nash. He comes out like a house on fire, starts beating up Jericho, got, takes no names. He, he beats up everybody in this and uh, it would be Kevin Nash who would be eliminated first. Kevin Nash, seemingly on top, throws some punches at Shawn Michaels. He goes down, gets Jericho in the um, position, ready for a jackknife powerbomb. Shawn Michaels pops up, give him, gives him the sweet chin music. Kevin Nash goes down like a sack of spuds. Jericho rolls over. We get the one, two, three. Nash takes a little while to leave here, uh, obviously feeling the effects of that sweet chin music, and it's always on the button. When he does come round, it is uh, Kevin Nash that would start a path of a path of rage. Uh, Jackknife power bombing Jericho first, then Randy Orton after smashing him into Shawn Michaels. Uh, and Shawn Michaels becomes busted open at this point, saying about the blood. There's not a lot in here, but obviously you'd expect it being chain link fence and stuff like that. So it's used well. Um, he does eventually leave, and we get the next competitor, which is Goldberg. He comes in with the standard big person spot, and they've done this with the women's elimination chambers in recent recent years as well. The big person spot comes in, takes everybody out, takes out Shawn Michaels, gets rid of Jericho and uh, Randy Orton, only for Triple H to then be released. Only not, because Ric Flair is doing everything he can. He's more entertaining than most things. Um, everything he can to keep that door shut. Make sure Goldberg can't get in. And they make a big deal about this being bulletproof glass that's impenetrable. Goldberg just kicks it down. <laughs> smashes it through with his leg. Gets a massive gash on the back of his leg, actually. It looks really nasty. Um, and starts beating on Triple H. Triple H is down. He's busted open now, obviously, having plexiglass flying in his face. Makes sense. Um, he then <clears throat> gets dragged out of the pod by Goldberg. Goldberg is fully on top here, beating down the world heavyweight champion and goes for the spear. Unbeknownst to Goldberg, Triple H has been past the sledgehammer. The greatest tag team partner of a person that could ever be. And as he's going for the spear, Triple H smashes him over the side of the head with the sledgehammer and gets the one, two, three. Triple H retains the world championship against all the odds. A little bit of cheating, but 
I can handle that. That's fine. So <clears throat> Triple H retains, but it's not over yet. Triple H then starts beating down on Goldberg. Obviously seeing him as a bit of a threat. Ric Flair comes in, starts beating down Goldberg. Randy Orton comes back with a set of handcuffs and we leave the show with Goldberg chained up against the side of the cell and getting beaten up by uh, Evolution. Uh, so, yeah, but again, a feud that would continue throughout the year. And uh, I I don't care what people say. I quite like Goldberg. I think he's he's got the look. He's got the intensity. And he had something where people absolutely adored him. And I was one of them. Not so much in recent years, obviously, but I think in 2003 it was a good a good move, even though he probably didn't want to. He did take the money in and, you know, use it well. He'd be gone by WrestleMania the following year uh, to a chorus of boos. He has recently obviously come back and, and kind of made up for that error. But the match, it, it's hard to follow at first and I got the feeling that the competitors in this match found it hard to follow that first although it's still an entertaining match it's not quite the spectacle of the first one and I'm going to give it three and a half cheap shots out of five because of the year of Triple H coming into play again that being said it's a decent match, and it's a great way to end a, a big pay-per-view like SummerSlam. So, SummerSlam 2003. Good show overall, actually. Really, really good. I've watched it through twice, actually, and didn't get bored at all. From the first match to the last match, it is pretty much a complete show, apart from the Eric Bischoff and uh, Shane McMahon match. Um... But yeah, it's it's a good show. It's decent and lots of surprises. You've got all your big stars on there. And it does what it says on the tin. It's a summer slam. And obviously we still get summer slams, but they're now four hours long and sponsored by multiple brands and, and things like that. This is when it was a bit more pure, but <clears throat> 2003 summer slam, very much worth a watch. Now... We move on to the next pay-per-view in September. And, uh, yeah, if you're listening on the podcast, welcome to the podcasting channel, Talk is Cheap. You'll also find on here some movie reviews that I go and see movies every week. Give you my thoughts on those. The wrestling reviews come once a month. And we're going through the year 2003, as it's been exactly 20 years to the day that this has been released, that these pay-per-views happen. Also got the YouTube channel. If you're listening on the YouTube channel, welcome. Make sure you subscribe and do all that stuff as well. We've also got a dedicated gaming channel of Games of the Week. Just random games being played there. And obviously the movie channel as well. So plenty to see, plenty to do. Lots of cheap shot stuff. And you once again, you are the Cheap Shot Nation. I've been your host, and I will see you next time. Goodbye. Hiya!